Welcome, or welcome back, to the Alexander Hamilton Institute's lecture series on Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. I'm Dr. David Frisk, a resident fellow at the AHI and a PhD in political science. This will be the first of eight lectures on President Reagan after the eight I did on President Roosevelt, which are available on YouTube. Our series was inspired by an adult class on those presidencies, which I taught at the AHI, an educational nonprofit organization here in upstate New York. These lectures, however, are written separately. Each is of podcast length, around 20 minutes. As we have done with FDR, we'll start with Reagan's early life and continue through his pre-presidential career. But in both cases, most of our lectures are about their presidencies. As everyone knows, Ronald Reagan, born in 1911, came from a humble background in small town in Illinois, then had a career as a prominent Hollywood actor, before running for governor of California at age 55. The ways in which and the extent to which a major historical figure's childhood or youth shaped their later achievements are not easy to judge. This may be especially true in the unusual case of a man whose adult life had two seemingly very different parts, acting and high-level politics, including the presidency. Nonetheless, the life of the very young Reagan tells us much about the leader that he later became. Ronald Reagan's two parents are described as utterly different from each other, with his father, Jack, a charming but sadly underachieving and alcoholic shoe salesman, and his mother, Nellie, in contrast, a strong woman who was both devoutly religious and greatly driven toward two things in addition to, but closely related to, her faith, helping the less fortunate in her community and putting on local dramatic productions. It's easy to get the impression, from accounts of his early life, that Reagan's father had far less influence on him than his mother. Jack Reagan, however, was blessed with a friendly, easygoing personality, including a good storytelling ability, all of which were later characteristic of his son and major advantages in his career. But Nellie's great concern for the world and the needy around her was no doubt an important preparation by an example for her son's later public life. And so probably was her unwillingness to believe bad things about people. Reagan would later describe his father as something of a rebel and his mother as a natural do-gooder. Nellie, he recalled, had the conviction that everyone loved her just because she loved them. My father's cynicism never made the slightest impression on her. Among the most striking aspects of Ronald Reagan's boyhood were his active athletic tendencies and his many performances in his mother's church theatricals. Only as an adult, after his college years, would he develop a keen interest in politics, but he already had an interest in public affairs. Many years later, in an interview during his first run for governor, Reagan recalled that it was living in a small town which had encouraged him to get involved in public issues. You're part of everything that goes on, he explained. In a small town, you can't stand on the sidelines and let somebody else do what needs doing. You can't coast along on someone else's opinions. That really is how I became an activist. I felt I had to take a stand on all the controversial issues of the day. There was a sense of urgency about getting involved. But in any case, it's clear that the personal qualities of both of young Reagan's parents were also natural preparations for his public career. It is important to understand the depth of Nellie Reagan's evangelical Protestant faith and along with that her sense of duty to others. She was not only dedicated to community-level humanitarianism, but was also believed to have abilities as a faith healer. One person remembered the way she prayed in such situations, down on her knees, eyes raised up and speaking like she knew God personally, like she had had lots of dealings with him before. Nellie Reagan combined this intense spirituality and faith, however, with an attractive personal style that was most strongly present in her voice. Like her son, Mrs. Reagan had what one author has called a distinctive, mellow voice, tinged with a hopeful cadence, one that made people feel that she, and later he, were speaking honestly. He had a likability, a modesty, and a posture that made him seem proud and humble, and perfectly matched his vocal qualities. From Nellie, he also learned what to do with his voice. When trying to be persuasive, he would lower the volume, speaking barely above a whisper, to win a confidential intimacy. 
and he instinctively knew just the right moments to raise that volume and lower the pitch for intensity. His voice had the humility and passion of a true believer, a manly, ingratiating voice made for promises. Ronald Reagan's most dramatic and intensive involvement in public issues during his youth was his leadership as a freshman of a remarkable student strike at the church-affiliated Eureka College in northern Illinois, which resulted from a variety of issues. Cuts in the number of classes, the president's attitude combined unhelpfully with what was apparently a domineering personality, that the college under depressionary conditions could no longer survive in such a small community that couldn't provide jobs for students who needed them, and in addition, the president's opposition to football, basketball, and dancing and smoking. Young Reagan's leadership of the student strike began when he was asked to sell the student body on the idea of staying away from classes in order to force the president's resignation. He rose successfully to the challenge, swaying the student audience's emotions and inspiring a mass response from it. Thus, we see an impressive example of early leadership in Reagan's college years. What we don't see at the time is a great dedication to learning, something that he seems to have taken more seriously in his adult life, even before his political career, when he did a great deal of reading in order to be well informed on public issues and their background. In college, Reagan's excellent memory, his ability to quickly memorize material, and his good ear for words allowed him to do well in his history, English, and French courses. And he seems also to have had a natural ability in economics, a topic that would be of much interest to him as an adult and as a political leader and president. But at Eureka, his studies were not his main priority. Several years after graduating as a young actor in Hollywood, Reagan would recall that he'd actually held back from attempts to be academically excellent, since that would have led him into a coaching job at some small school, which was far from the strong ambition he already had to be in the movies. To get a coach's job at a college, he explained, you naturally had to have a certain scholastic standing, so I was careful not to get it. I even dropped some courses so that I'd be behind in the educational credits. The very athletic Dutch, as he was known, took more interest in football, swimming, and the drama club. When acting in school plays, he was often said by reviewers to have presence on stage. As for football, the team's manager respected what he recalled as Reagan's notable nerve and determination. But although he loved the sport, as so many Midwestern boys of his generation did, Reagan was better at swimming and, of course, had spent summers during high school as a lifeguard on a dangerous stretch of river near his hometown of Dixon. He ran track, became the college's swimming coach and a cheerleader for the basketball team, and was president of the Boosters Club, an editor of the yearbook, and a member of the student senate. As a young man from a poor family, he also did work on the campus like sh shoveling snow, waiting on tables, and st stoking furnaces. It seems likely the Dutch never had a free moment. A few additional points about Reagan and the Depression. His father, Jack, was laid off at around Christmas time in 1931, and he and Nellie moved into just one room of their previous apartment with no kitchen, only a hot plate. The grocer stopped their credit, and neighbors brought in food on trays. For similar reasons, many students at Eureka College had to drop out. Dutch sent his parents money he had earned and pulled in his belt. Since Jack Reagan was unable to find a job, he put all his energy in the coming year, 1932, into volunteer work for presidential candidate Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats, who were very much the minority party in Dixon and northern Illinois. The Depression, though, wasn't an entirely new experience for the young Reagan. As Anne Edwards, author of the main book on his early life, observes, Dutch had not seen the prosperity the rest of America saw in the 20s. His life had been unrelieved, pinching and saving, doing without, being grateful for little in the way of luxury. His immediate ambition was not riches, just better conditions, bills paid money in the bank for an emergency. Another likely influence on the later Reagan was the fact that the residents of Dixon responded to the Depression by trying to take care of themselves. Not wanting to be on government relief, they joined hands and helped each other out. The town lacked a wide range of socioeconomic classes, but rather was generally lower middle class, something that made people feel they were all in it together. 
A bit later, in the early New Deal years, Reagan's father got government work, distributing food to the needy in Dixon and finding work for them. People often had to refuse his offers of temporary jobs because by working even a few days, they would lose their eligibility for relief payments. After graduating from Eureka in the depths of the Depression, Reagan managed to get a job as a sports announcer at a radio station in nearby Davenport, Iowa, despite his lack of radio experience, which then led to an even more important break. Before long, he was hired as chief sports announcer at one of the Midwest's major stations, WHO in Des Moines, a job that doubled his previous salary, made him a local celebrity, and brought him the contacts that within a few years helped lead to his opportunity to become a movie actor. Within a short time, Dutch Reagan was familiar throughout the Midwest among sports fans. He was the voice of Big Ten college football, also broadcasting Chicago Cubs games. He often had to pretend to be at the game and was quite talented at describing it from the studio. Reagan clearly enjoyed his status as a well-known personality in Des Moines, happily waving like a friendly celebrity at people who recognized him. Even in his very full dating life, he was comfortable with, as it's sometimes called in politics, seeing and being seen. One model he went out with would later recall how he would look over his shoulder more than at her. Scanning the crowd, she said, like a born politician. As a young man, and even into early middle age, Reagan was not only a Democrat, but a very liberal Democrat, who strongly supported President Roosevelt and the New Deal. But in Des Moines, he began his strong penchant, which was soon set him apart from people in Hollywood, for detailed opinionating on current events and politics. He was exposed to well-informed Republican views and decided it would be important to do his homework in order to effectively counter them. A friend later remembered Reagan's passion in these discussions, the tight, chin-jutting demeanor with which he expressed his views. Perhaps the first right-of-center influence on the young liberal was a man named Harold Gross, who was then WHO's news director and later a longtime congressman from Iowa. Whenever Gross, or another conservative whom Dutch knew and often talked with, made a point that he felt unable to answer to his full satisfaction, he would look through books and articles before they next met in order to be better prepared. By the end of his years in Des Moines, he remained as enthusiastic as ever about Roosevelt, but had started to talk more negatively about the federal government for becoming too intrusive into people's lives. He also seems to have agreed with his father that living on relief or welfare was degrading for those who experienced it and that major unions were too often controlled by thugs. Despite his own financial comfort in the radio station job, the young Reagan remained close to his hard-pressed parents, not just personally, but even to an extent in terms of his modest lifestyle. He enjoyed being something of a man about town, yet did not become a big spender. He also remained strongly influenced by both his mother's selfless compassion and his father's down-to-earth camaraderie with people, despite what were already his great ambition and his strong ego. Reagan's father had suffered a heart attack and could no longer work. His mother, meanwhile, had been toiling 10-hour days, six days a week, mostly on her feet so they could get by. He had a budget, and he held fastidiously to it, Ann Edwards writes. He shunned credit and bought only what he had saved money to buy. He was the first to offer comfort to anyone in ill health or suffering grief. He had retained his boyish charm, his Irish way with a story and a guilelessness or innocent manner that never ceased to surprise. He had an extreme modesty along with his remarkable voice, which was simultaneously hospitable, straightforward, charming, and persuasive. As biographer Luke Cannon would write many years later of both the young and the later Reagan, he had faith in the future of the country and in his own future, and his unfailing optimism and self-deprecating humor commended him to others. While he formed few close friendships, he was widely popular, and people liked to hear him talk. He had a fantastic memory and a knack for explaining things. One example of another Reagan characteristic, his frequent good luck, was the connection between his WHO job and his start in Hollywood. Reagan managed to get himself sent to Southern California to see the Chicago Cubs spring training in 1937. And while out there, he got a studio to give him a screen test, which led quickly to a film contract and thus his move to Los Angeles. 
It helped that he already had some contact with the industry due to the fact that celebrities sometimes came through Des Moines on personal appearance tours, and one of his responsibilities between sporting events was to interview them. Next time, we will discuss several key points about Reagan's years in the movie world, and later as a public speaker for General Electric. But for now, to conclude this first lecture, I'll just emphasize his continued interest in following public affairs and expressing his views about them, even in what was, in that era, a less politicized Hollywood than exists now. As someone later remembered about Reagan on movie-making sets, Ronnie was never bored, since he used all the slack time during these 10-hour days, full of waiting, as a chance to share his opinions on many subjects. He always provided statistics to make his points, as if he had a kind of mental file for every issue. One thing that made this possible was that he did relatively little socializing in Hollywood, which left him with the free time to do lots of reading. To get ahead of our story for a moment, it turned out that Reagan found acting too limiting. One of the high points in his film career was the critically acclaimed movie King's Row, which included perhaps his most famous line, Where's the rest of me? The anguished cry of his character upon waking from surgery and seeing that his legs were amputated. Reagan would later note that in about 1946, after World War II and nearly a decade in Hollywood, he had to ask myself the same question. It was a question that did much to clarify for him what an actor's life inevitably was. So much of our profession, Reagan reflected, is taken up with pretending, with the interpretation of never-never roles, that an actor must spend at least half his waking hours in fantasy, in rehearsal, or shooting. If he is only an actor, I feel, he is much like I was in King's Row, only half a man, no matter how great his talents. Reagan also noted, I began to feel like a shut-in invalid, nursed by publicity, which the industry provided plenty of for major actors. I have always liked space, the feeling of freedom, a broad range of friends and variety. Now I had become a semi-automaton, creating a character another had written, doing what still another person told me to do on set. I could barely believe the colored shadow on the screen was myself. Possibly this was the reason I decided to find the rest of me. Thank you for watching or listening to the first of the Alexander Hamilton Institute's lectures on Ronald Reagan. See you next time.